Good afternoon, I wish to all. Welcome back to the Seminar of Good Practices in Supervising Cross Graduates. So far we have gone through together three modules and we hope that you will have a much clearer view on what it takes to be a good supervisor and be able to tackle many of the challenging issues that may arise during your profession. Now since now we will be um, uh, turning to the last session of the seminar. I'm sure you all have known very well our amazing speakers, but we have our first timer here, so let me introduce again to the background of our speakers. Starting with Professor Gina Whisker. Now she has worked in educational and development since the early 1980s initially in her previous role at Anglia Ruskin University where she also coordinated women's studies and taught English. Gina completed her PhD at Nottingham University where she worked on a study of representations of self in contemporary English and American fiction and followed that with three years at the Centre of Higher Educational Studies, Institute of Education, London University, as the researcher for the inquiry into the role of the external examiner. She received her title Professor of Higher Education and Contemporary Literature. In 2006, she moved to Brighton to take up her current post as a Principal Fellow of the Higher Education Academy and a National Teaching Fellow. She is also active in the Staff and Educational Development Association, SIDA, and received a SIDA Legacy Award for Outstanding Scholarship in 2013, which is last year. <laughs> Quite recent, eh? <laughs> Other than that, thank you for the applause. <laughs> Other than that, she has been chair and co-chair of HEDG, which is Heads of Educational Development Group, and has run workshops and given keynotes at a number of learning and teaching conferences in Australia, South Africa, Sweden, Singapore and Ireland over the last few years. Gina also conducts workshops for the British Council in Saudi Arabia. Gina is committed to making a successful discipline profile as a key foundation for credibility as an academic colleague involved in and facilitating the development of others engaged in the scholarship of teaching in higher education. She has written numerous articles and has offered frequent lectures and papers that are related to the profession of teaching literature in English and creative writing. She continues to research and publish in both learning and teaching areas, specializing in postgraduate student learning and supervisory practices, and in her discipline, specializing in women's Gothic and post-colonial writing. In 2005, she authored The Good Supervisor, second edition, 2012, Palgrave Macmillan. Among her contemporary literature works are Essential Guide to Criticism on Margaret Atwood, Teaching African American Women's Writing, Key Concepts in Postcolonial Literature, and Mosaic, A Vision of Cyprus. And now we move on to Dr. Gillian Robinson. Now she is a reader emerita at Anglia Ruskin University. She completed her PhD, MA, and Bachelor of Education with honours <coughs> at London University. Her work experience and publications mainly focus on postgraduate students' learning, including issues of cross-cultural supervision and threshold concepts. It is based on research derived from running an international PhD program for 12 years. Her continuing research interests are in the area of art and design education, with publications on the value of sketchbooks as a tool for developing creativity thinking skills and metacognition. Now, without further delay, I introduce to you, um, not the speaker, of her, but the uh, title of our session, last session, which is um, Developing or Encouraging Creativity in Research and Supervising Creative Research. This workshop uh, is hoped to develop and encourage sense of creativity on research journey provide support throughout the journey of producing creative research, contribute on students' projects, as well as how supervisors can benefit from it. And without further ado, let's give a round of applause to Dr. Gillian Robinson.
Thank you very much for your introduction and good afternoon everybody and welcome to this, the final session of the um, workshops that we've been having. You've heard that there's some aspect of creativity in my experience and I'm a bit of a hybrid really because I'm a practicing and exhibiting artist. My degrees are all in art and design education but I also work with Gina in particular on postgraduate thinking and research and development and a lot of that is as the result of running this PhD program, uh, international program that uh, introducer has just mentioned. Uh, I'd really like you to raise your hand if you think you are a creative person. Do you think you're creative? It's a difficult question, isn't it? Because creativity is such a complex word and it's one that we don't really very easily understand. I think perhaps we understand it most in terms of the creative genius and I don't think I am one. Um, it's names like Einstein that come to mind when we think of creative genius and we often think of uh, the creative genius perhaps in terms of the fields of science um, but we also, um, well, I'll ask you, where do you think most creativity happens? In what field? If you were asked, which field could be the most creative potentially? Art. Um, and I think that's, generally speaking, um, an assumption. But if we look at one of the famous creative artists, Leonardo da Vinci, who kept all these wonderful sketchbooks, if we look into those sketchbooks, we see that he wasn't just an artist, he was also an engineer and a scientist. Um, and in the book that I recently published called Think Inside the Sketchbook, um, the introductory part of it, or the first half of it, looks at a whole range of people who use sketchbooks in a creative way. And it includes mathematicians, uh, architects, choreographers, musicians, writers and the sketchbooks that they keep are for their creative ideas so I'd like to suggest that creativity doesn't just happen in the field of art and design that it's a much more general attribute for example um, I know that this university is focused very much on environmental issues um, and Darwin the English nat naturalist um, also kept creative notebooks and is seen as a person with very creative ideas about branching patterns of evolution and natural selection. So it is a very broadly uh, experienced phenomenon but a very complex one. A lot of the literature revolves around the creative individual and it entails um, moments of inspiration. Um, it's what we call the eureka factor where maybe you've been thinking of something for a very long time, mulling it over in your mind, you don't understand something and then all of a sudden it's, you go, I get it. It's a little bit like the conceptual threshold moment that uh, Gina was talking about earlier. It's when you suddenly understand something or you suddenly have what we call a bright idea and you get cartoons of people with light bulbs on their heads showing that they're suddenly enlightened by something new. <clears throat> but our focus is actually not going to be on the creative individual and their light bulb moments, nor is it going to be on the creative genius. Uh, what I, we would like to look at in this session, and Jean is going to come in um, on this session in a moment, I want to look at the possibility of developing and encouraging creativity in research. Now you might ask, is that a good thing? And this is one of the things that we want to discuss and look at. Um, just think, well put your hand up, would you want to supervise somebody who was doing creative research? Yes? You'd all be happy with that? Anybody who wouldn't be comfortable supervising somebody who is doing creative research? May I ask a question first? Yes. Uh, I heard... Good afternoon, everybody. 
I've read somewhere that it is not possible to develop a new group of creativity until within a certain period of time. I think it is between uh, 8 to 12 or 13 years of age. So first of all, please answer this question. Is it possible to improve and develop creativity? A person at the age of 40, she is a lecturer, for example. Is it possible to improve the creativity? Oh, I think it's always impossible to improve creativity. Let's, here's a person's opinion over here. For creativity, my question is, suppose the supervisor, the students, both of them are interested. But here the question is the fun. If you want to do some creativity, you need the support, the sponsor. So are you sure? If it is not available, then how can you proceed? Um, I, I think what you're saying is um, there is an element of risk, which is what we're going to look at in a minute. And I think you're saying that creativity is a complex thing. And is it something that you can only nurture when children are young? I mean, I believe that babies are creative because one of the major elements in the creative mind is that of curiosity. And if you look at a baby, one of the things that really stands out is their curiosity. Everything they pick up, they want to put in their mouths, they want to feel. Um, when they can begin to talk, everything is, why this, why that, can I? It's all sorts of questions. Um, I don't want to go into the field of art and design education or keep on about the book that I wrote, but it was looking at um, the possibility that very small children can behave as researchers. Mm. And it's because of this curiosity that they have. And I think that sometimes education, in the way that we deliver it, actually stops that creativity. And then later on, we expect people to be researchers, which for me is like creative curiosity. And uh, there's a very famous um, art critic called Roger Fry, who at the turn of the last century said, all children are artists, and in between, and mainly adults can't draw, in between comes something called art education. And I think the same can be applied in terms of the researcher. All tiny children and babies are curious. They are little researchers. Um, later on, we expect that the adult perhaps can have the ability to research. But sometimes in between, there comes something which prevents that research from thriving and developing. And I think if we encourage the research and the creativity from a very early age through, we will not get this problem that can you develop somebody as a creative person at 40 because it's part of their life style. It's, it's the way they think. It's a mindset. Um, so I, that's a convoluted answer to your question. In terms of your question, we'll come to that later because I think it perhaps involves things concerning risk and perhaps there is more risk in a creative PhD and if you've got funding, maybe you're not going to get funding so readily if it's seen as a risky project. But uh, let's move on. So I'd, I'd like... Hmm. <coughs> Sorry, I've got the wrong PowerPoint. <laughs> I'm going back. I'm going to invent something before that. Um, I think creative research, and I want to explore this, involves two things. It involves stretching the bounds of what is traditionally seen as scholarly. And I think it also involves being comfortable with disequilibrium and risk. And this is why I say we're going to look at risk. So let's look first of all at stretching the bounds of what is traditionally seen as scholarly. What kinds of PhD or research do you think might involve that stretching of the boundaries. Would anybody like to suggest something? Normally the PhD is a big 80,000 word book. When might it not be that? At the back? Transdisciplinary. Transdisciplinary, yes. It could be a much more complex document then. Anything else? Have any of you come across the possibility of a practice-based uh, piece of research 
uh, where there is a performance or an exhibition or some piece of musical composition. Have any of you seen any of those or are aware of them? Put up your hands if you are aware of that. Not many of you. Um, it's a developing area um, of PhD research where it's possible to do part of your PhD as a performance or as an exhibition or perhaps as a piece of choreography or as um, a musical a composition. And the writing then is something which is interactive with that piece of practical work. Um, it's something we're going to look at later because in the next part of this presentation we've got some examples of that. Um, and uh, Gina is supervising somebody with a very creative PhD at the moment and I've also supervised somebody whose PhD um, was initially a series of self-portraits and these self-portraits were drawn <coughs> over a period of three years, drawn and painted over a period of three years and then she used them as her data. And she then had to write the theoretical part of her thesis related to these self-portraits as data. So this is stretching the boundaries of what is traditionally a piece of uh, PhD research and what is traditionally seen as scholarly. Now, I guess if you've got something as original as that, what do you think might be the issues in supervising something like that? And I'd like you to just turn to somebody nearby you, and you know the form now, we do this a lot, and Gina says I want a lot of noise, and just think for a moment, if you were the supervisor of something like the person who painted those portraits, um, or somebody who'd got an exhibition, or who'd done some dancing, um, even if it's not in your field, you can still imagine what the issues might be. What might the issues be in supervising something like that? Have a little think and talk to your neighbour and you have five minutes just to think of some issues that might arise from that situation. side of the room. Anybody on this line along here at the back, can I have one of your issues from your discussion please? Over on the far left. A volunteer please, can you turn on your microphone? Thank you. So from the supervisor point of view, yes. we were thinking, um, my good friend was talking about somebody who wanted to, let's say, combine music with a topic in mathematics. Ooh. Wow. What with mathematics? Music. 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 Yeah. Yeah. It's not an impossible thing to do. Yeah. From our background, we are purely mathematicians, assuming. Yeah. And so one of the ways we thought as, a, as mm -hmm. supervisors we could be of help to suggest, but not to discourage him. But if it is possible to also co opt somebody from the music department mm -hmm. who can bring the music perspective so that we can, together as a team, um, bring up. So ours would be from the mathematics point of view, then we can get some perspective from somebody who is more competent in the music process. So that's one way we can go about it. So there's a problem, but there's a solution. So yes. if you've got one of these creative PhDs, which is um, across disciplines, then you might feel that you are disabled as a supervisor because you don't have knowledge of the field in one of those aspects that are being combined. But as you say, the solution is to take somebody from another department or another faculty with that, in, with that knowledge. And then it becomes a very enriching situation because you learn from each other and it's a not an impossible thing. So that's an issue, but you have the solution. Anybody else with an issue? 
Let's continue around this side of the room for a minute. Going around the top at the back there. Anybody with, a, with an issue? No problem. No issues. Okay, this line here. Anybody in this line? To the left of me here? In the front. Any issues with supervising something creative? I'm thinking about being uh, creative. If student is creative, but uh, sometimes, uh, you know, sometimes because of the necessary concept of curious, maybe lack of curious for supervisors, uh, the potential of the program cannot approve or achieve in the, the way that, for example, uh, students want. Yes, that's a very interesting point because if you've got a curious student and you've got a supervisor who doesn't have that imagination or curiosity and also institutional problems that can't actually contain mm -hmm. that strange shaped piece of research, then you might have problems. The problem is that, the, for example, for me, this happened that uh, finally the, the, my funding was not based on the potential of the research that I, I did. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe the funding is not so uh, strong funding, uh, but the potential of research is high. Yeah, so you've got high potential, but you've got lots of opportunity to crash or for it not to fulfill the potential from, uh, that it had in the beginning. Um, yeah, we'll talk about that a little bit later as well. Okay, coming round the corner, let's stay with this front group. Anybody round this right-hand side? Any suggestions about issues? It is going to be a bit of a problem to justify the novelty part for the PhD. It's difficult to justify the novelty part. Yeah. In the original proposal it might be. If you're trying to get it through a committee that isn't interested in something innovative, um, but wants to actually keep you within the boundaries of something that's already recognisable and is more easily assessed. So it might be difficult to get it recognised in the first place. Yeah, um, in Malaysia, we're quite sensitive to definition. You have to argue over the novelty uh, in the best COE. Yeah. It's, it's, it's unclear that people might say it's, it looks normal, but it's actually not. So <laughs> there's going to be quite an issue here. I think actually. Um, maybe the part solution to that is that you have to explain a lot more. If you've got something which is novel and different, then you've got to explain something a lot more clearly to convince somebody that it is just as viable as something which is more recognisable. It's the same if you've got something which is going to make a contribution in another culture or something which is unusual in one cultural context but normal in another. For example, we had somebody in our university who I supervised actually who wanted to look at taking artists into school as a way of developing um, children as artists. Now in the UK that's been happening since the 1980s but in the country where this student was working it was completely innovative. So she had to argue a case that for her, it was going to be a contribution to a specific context, but at the same time, there would be some element of it being a contribution to knowledge generally, and that's a very hard thing to do. Um, so what you're doing is arguing for something different, but sometimes it makes you a stronger researcher, and it certainly did with the person who did the series of self-portraits because she had to find suitable methodologies, which we'll go on to later, and she had to really um, own what she had done and the arguments throughout that thesis. But she almost kind of went beyond the knowledge of her supervisors in the end because she had to be such a strong researcher in order to be able to convince the examiners at the end, which she managed to do. And in the end, it became a conversation between her and the examiner. It's almost like a tutorial from the student. It was quite an exciting viva. So there are some very interesting, exciting elements that come out of this kind of research, but it's also a risky business. Um, anybody else over this side of the room, just quickly, with an issue? For the creativity research, suppose the student wants to do, already he has done his presentation, what is his proposal, or his project, okay. But uh, when but the supervisor, uh, his or her lack of knowledge in that field, 
but they found that yes, the student is brilliant, he has some creative idea. So should women give him or her the chance to proceed or not? Because sometimes the question is arising, she or he could be finished within the period, suppose the time limitation is three or four years. But uh, sometimes we found that to create something new, the novelty work, it takes more than this. But I, I know that universities are very concerned with completion times. And our universities... No, if the, because my question is, suppose the fund is finished, then how can... Okay, so it's about funding, yes. yes. Um, I, I don't know what happens in terms of funding for something like that. I just know that my... Uh, young sometimes yeah. in the experiment, in the engineering experiment, when yeah. they go for the experiment, they try to do it, but they didn't get the expected result in first time, second time, third time. Yeah, so it's going to because take longer and more funding. Improve, yeah. yes. But funding, you know, if something's worthwhile, funding has to be found. My youngest son's a sculptor. He's just been invited to put a big sculpture in London in, in Spitalfields, in front of the Norman Foster building. It's because made of when, because I yeah. ask the question, suppose if they, in this creativity, they will go for patent, right? Yeah. When they will apply for the patent, they will try to establish it. And so the costing is also increasing. Well, we had a, um, a, a point this morning, didn't we, about patents and publishing. And I think you, you've just described no, no, something. No, not for publishing. No, no. Then, you uh, for the research. <laughs> because when they will go for the patent, they already applied for the patent, and they proceed for that one. In engineering, this is the challenging because when they apply for the patent, they got the patent, and the, they have to continue the patent fees, and it's not a small one. So that's why the creativity, suppose, and, and in some cases, if there is one student only for creative, he or she don't have any other researcher in that field. So do you think so? It is for, it will it will not be challenging. I I think it is challenging, but I think challenging is not a problem. Um, and I think if we don't take up challenges and push boundaries, sometimes this new things it won't happen. And I I guess the creative geniuses of this world weren't without their challenges. I think all of them faced challenges, and their creative work was rejected, and sometimes it was ahead of its time. And I'm sure they ran out of money. Um, and as I was trying to say, my youngest son had to bid for funding to do this thing. He was invited to do it. It took him a long time to bid for the funding um, for it. But you have to believe in it, and you have to find ways to do it. And if you're into a piece of research, which is ahead even of your supervisors, um, it happens. And I think sometimes supervisors are humbled by their students. Um, I th I th if you think about it, even at a smaller level, every PhD student who applies to do research is actually ahead of their supervisor because they've identified a gap in knowledge that their supervisor hasn't thought of. And so right from the beginning, you have to be the expert in that slice of cake if you think back to Gina's diagram, that you've chosen to research in. So in terms of the field of knowledge and the small slice of it you've decided to explore for your PhD, you're always going to be the expert. Your supervisor understands the field and can guide, but in some element of that, you are the leader. And if you're doing a piece of very creative research, maybe you're even further ahead. But I think as a PhD student, in your particular um, chosen aspect of the field, you are the leader. And the funding is another issue. I know that is a very difficult thing. But in terms of the difficulty of supervision, um, you are becoming more independent as you research as a PhD student. You can lean to some extent on the resourcefulness and the expertise and the experience of your supervisor but particularly if you're a creative researcher, you have to be strong. Um, and I challenged this student who did the um, self-portrait right at the beginning, and I said, you can... She had two proposals. One was a safe one. One was this creative, risky one. I said, you have a choice. You can go with the safe one, and I will supervise you. 
you can go with the risky one, the creative one, I will still supervise you, but you have got to be strong. You've got to find appropriate methodologies. You've got to be able to argue your case. You've got to be rigorous. Um, every PhD student should be like that, but in her case, it was essential. And what you get often is a very strong outcome and a very strong student. So yes, there will be problems and issues, but there are ways of overcoming those. And as a supervisor, you learn lots. You learn lots as a supervisor anyway. But in this particular context and situation, you are learning very fast alongside your student. So it's an exciting thing to be involved in. But we digress. What have we got there, Gina? <laughs> Three sentences. Right. So students could be ahead of the <coughs> but Sorry. Me? You want to go back? Okay. Can so students you? need to sometimes... Oh, we're right at the beginning. Right. We had lots. Um, so there's the question of transdisciplinarity. So you get students from different departments. So, for example, maths and music combination. Um, sometimes you get a problem, perhaps, of the student being more curious than the supervisor. Um, you get the potential for the institution not to be able to contain this uh, or <coughs> enable the research. It might be difficult to justify the novelty of the PhD at the proposal stage. Um, and moving on. Um, but on the plus side, um, arguably something different could make you a stronger researcher, uh, particularly if you find suitable methodologies. Um, but then we had this problem of creating something new sometimes takes longer. Um, and if there's a funding issue there, then that can be problematic. The taking longer, though, I think sometimes these creative PhDs have to be appreciated as something different. Um, maybe we're afraid of difference sometimes, and I think institutionally we're afraid of difference. But I think we shouldn't be uh, seen to be in the situation where we prevent something really creative from happening. You know, what if we prevented Einstein and Darwin and... You know, we'd be feeling very guilty now. So sometimes we have to allow for this creative person in our midst um, and find ways to push boundaries to accommodate them and to even sit back and appreciate them sometimes as well. Oh, and no, I think we've, we've talked about being ahead. Oh, mm -hmm. but, <laughs> so students do need to be ahead of the supervisor. They need to be very knowledgeable about what they're doing and very determined that it has potential and value. So thank you for that. That was uh, way and above what I had lamely put here, which was issues of originality and new knowledge, um, which is really what we've looked at. There are issues of what can be seen as new knowledge, particularly if you've got something, um, for example, like in the arts or in music, is the new knowledge in that practical event? Or is the new knowledge only in the theory? And there are some um, groups of people now who are pushing for the possibility of the PhD being only the performance. And that the new knowledge is in the creativity of that performance. We haven't got there yet, I don't think, but that's the possibility. Um, so there are issues of where is the knowledge? Where is the new knowledge situated? Is it situated only in the theoretical argument and the conclusions from that or can there be new knowledge in something practical like an art exhibition or um, the planting of a forest you know if, if there is a reason behind that um, can that be a creative and uh, potentially new arena for uh, extending knowledge but there are also practical issues um, there are practical issues of what is the relationship of the documentation to the practical aspect of it. Um, how much should there be um, a written piece and how much should there be a practical element. And also, <coughs> for some students, there is some problem. They might be very good at the practical side of things, but they might be not very good at the theoretical part of it. And, you know, do we hinder the practical inventor of things um, because we demand a high theoretical um, contribution. There's all sorts of arguments and practical problems in there. Um, and also, as we said, there are issues of the, the supervision. 
Um, so I'd like to just ask you a question. In your opinion, maybe why is not sufficient, maybe it is <laughs> it important to acknowledge creativity in research. How many of you think it is important to acknowledge creativity in research? It is important. It might be difficult, but it is important. Why is it important? Anybody got any ideas or suggestions as to why it's important to acknowledge creativity in research? Because it can cause breakthroughs sometimes. You can cause breakthroughs. Anything else? I think um, it allows and encourages flexibility in what is this rigid PhD um, format that we have at the moment. Mm -hmm. Maybe we need to push the boundaries. Um, but as a supervisor, how would you enable and support your students in creative research? It's a difficult one. It is a difficult one. <laughs> okay, you've got five minutes <laughs> to unravel little bits of this difficult question. You're faced with a creative student. What elements of your experience and expertise would you apply or what new aspects of expertise could you bring to bear on the supervision of this creative student? Have a think. I'm stretching you now as supervisors um, and maybe as students what you might want to expect from your supervisor. So have a think. Try it. Let's hear lots of noise and talking. I'm told that the people filing out are not filing out because they're fed up with the session but they have something to go to. They told us that beforehand. <laughs> That's their excuse. <laughs> no, I believe them. <laughs> uh, it's probably tough if you're not a supervisor. I know some of you are students, but think of it from your student perspective. What would you hope from your supervisor in this situation? What would you hope they could offer you? Uh, uh, it's not creativity. I guess it's not happening in the PhD because uh, we have to follow some format and frame of the PhD and all of this is with creativity. And I guess creativity is true, you know. I mean, the matter like this is what music for something. It's good for the PhD of art. But what for, for us, we, even we want to publish our paper. We have this framework, we have to follow the framework and regulations. So all of these things with creativity, I guess it's not happening that much. Or maybe we have some innovation, but not creative. I'm not suggesting that it's happening now or that it even is possible within some frameworks that are established now, or even perhaps within some disciplines. Um, it would be very difficult to perhaps be creative as a brain surgeon. I don't know, but it might be dangerous. Um, but there are certain general um, uh, aspects of this, I think, which should be applied to PhD thinking or to research thinking. And I think we should never say never. You know, I think we shouldn't say that it isn't possible. If it is not possible now, it's not ever possible. I think we should say, let's look at it. And this is about the risk taking. Um, I'm not a risk taker with a lot of things. I'm not a risk taker with my family or with money even. I don't have much to take risks with. But um, I am a risk taker in terms of thinking and in terms of what is possible. And I think if we always worked within boundaries um, and didn't push them, as you say, there wouldn't be innovations, there wouldn't be breakthroughs. So all I'm doing is trying to stretch <laughs> uh, what already is there into another <coughs> possible 
form, more flexible form. Gina wants to say something. Okay, some of the creativity can be in the methodology. I'm just going to give you an example of, of um, Professor Ivor Goodson, who's at Brighton, who is world-renowned for his methodology, and Professor Vernon Trafford, who came from Anglia Ruskin, who publishes books on supervision. So Ivor Goodson developed a methodology which he called narrative inquiry because he wanted to ask people to tell their stories analyze the stories and from that I don't mean you know once upon a time I mean the story of my professional journey through life and to analyze those to look at key thematic moments in order to explore how people build up a professional life how they contribute to the community and so he developed a new methodology called narrative inquiry he's now written lots of books on it so this was 20 years ago Professor Vernon Trafford wanted to write in a business and management context. He wanted to look at cases, cases of you know, successful business and management and the people involved in it. And he used himself as a case study. This was also innovative and creative at the time. You might still feel unsure about using yourself as a case study in one of five case studies. But that was Vernon's PhD thesis, so that must be a very long time ago since he's doing all these books and going around the world and he's retired. So the creativity does not necessarily have to be in the production of a new designer product. It can be in the production of a new methodology or a new shape to the PhD. So when you think of supervising it, you've got to think outside that box as well, that it's not just an art product. We're giving you those examples to get you thinking. You can be creative in your methodology. You can be creative in the shape of the PhD. When, when can you do it? When, can, when and how can you supervise it? Yeah, there was one uh, PhD that I supervised where the candidate combined Tai Chi with stress in teaching. And it seemed a really unlikely thing to do. And it was a struggle. And one of his supervisors backed away. And he was a very experienced supervisor. Uh, I hung on to him because I could see he was an intelligent person, uh, was very convinced that there was a valuable outcome potentially in this. And in the end, it was a very interesting twist because this very experienced supervisor came back into the process when he could see that I had stuck with this student. And right at the end, he read it and he said, do you know the new knowledge in this thesis is that you've discovered a new methodology? And so sometimes you have to hang on with the student and you have to believe in them. And it's tough. But this whole turnaround where the supervisor who opted out because he thought it was too risky opted back in at the end when he saw that this student had completed it and he had the Eureka model with the student and went, look, this is what you've done because we were struggling over what was the new knowledge. And it wasn't particularly in the combination of these two things, but trying to deal with the combination of them um, and defend having done that, the new knowledge turned out to be a completely different methodology, which is what he invented, really, to deal with it and to explore this. So, as Gina said, you know, sometimes it is the methodologies and you have to explore really different methodologies to fit some of these and they're out there you know we tend to do the whole kind of uh, questionnaire you know um, routine kinds of methodolo uh, methodologies and ways of getting data but there are more obscure ones out there and if you're doing something really creative you have to hunt them out so you have to research the right methodologies to go with it as well um, because, we, oh, just, just the last two then. Yeah. Can I, we start at the back? You have a question. Yeah, I'm getting quite confused. Is creativity just about your recent contribution? Sorry, say that again. Well, your, the definition of creativity is just about the recent contribution. The creativity can be different aspects of the thesis. It might be a creative research contribution. It might be something different. The creativity might be in the way in which the thesis looks at the end, when it's part practical activity and part theory. The creativity might be in the methodology. 
the way you use the methodology, your choice of methodology. Um, just to give a very simple example, um, research is sometimes done with one research question, but the inquiry is done in a positive, positivistic way. Um, but then somebody might come along and do it differently, but with a different methodology. Um, you know, so there's very little uh, aspects of creativity already in research and the way it's done and the different methodologies and the way in which the outcome from using those uh, creates something different at the end. Um, but the, the creativity, I think what we're confusing is creativity is you make something new as a product at the end of something. As Gina said, it's not a new label for a bottle of water or a new way to bottle water necessarily. Sometimes it is. But there are other forms of creativity. And it's about uh, innovation. It's about new combinations. Um, I want to move on to the next slide. Are we there, Gina? We are processing. Um, because I want to look at the way in which creativity happens. So it comes out of conflicting ideas. And I think we've recognised quite a lot of conflict in this room in what we've been talking about. But it's the way in which you manage conflict sometimes. Um, it, it comes with a creative solution. So it's a, sometimes about managing conflicting ideas or wanting to explore conflicting ideas. I mean, even in looking at literature, you have to admit sometimes that there are very different opinions about things and different theories about things. So we already deal with conflict when we're doing research and when we're looking at the literature about our research topic. So I think we have to be uh, comfortable with conflicting ideas and see what comes out of those. Um, it comes out of problems. So creativity and creative solutions come from admitting problems. <coughs> uh, things that are not working, which is similar to problems, but when things are not working, we have to be creative with them. We have to think differently. We call it outside the box, divergent thinking. Um, and we have to work through and with difference as well. Um, sometimes we want normal. We feel comfortable with normal. Um, we don't like difference. But if you want creativity and creative situations to thrive, then you have to be comfortable with difference. Lastly, I would suggest that we have to be able to make connections. And you've already given us one possibility, the connection between maths and music. Um, one of the staff in our university looked at aesthetics in maths for his PhD. So he was looking at the aesthetic elements of mathematics. So in some respects, he was combining art, combining art and maths. So it's about making connections between things that perhaps haven't been connected before. Um, but you do have to have knowledge in your own field and maybe adopt the knowledge of somebody else in another field when you are making these connections. Um, what you do has to continue to have subject integrity as well. Um, but the ability to accommodate um, and it has to be interconnections which are suited perhaps to, to future uh, possibilities. So what I want to do is summarise now and we're going to move on to the second part of this which is a little bit more about how you supervise it. And I just want to say that what we've talked about um, is that Creativity in PhD is challenging. It's a risky business. Um, it needs appropriate methodology. It certainly requires rigour, both from the student and from the supervisor. And ultimately, it's going to need a very thoughtful choice of examiner. Because you may have got a student and a supervisor who come to an understanding about the viability of this research, but one of the biggest risks is when you come to the choice of examiner. There might not be somebody who is up to the challenge. So maybe that is one of the more risky parts of it. But 
in the case of the student with the self-portraits, um, she was so convincing that the examiner could see beyond the fact that it was a self-portrait. The self-portrait became the data and a vehicle for something else. Um, and at the end of the day, PhD research is about new knowledge and what we research through is a vehicle to get into that new knowledge. In her case, um, it was unusual, but it doesn't mean to say it wasn't rigorous and at the end of the day that there wasn't some new knowledge there. There was. So we're now going to continue to explore both the supervision and some examples of this, some case studies. And Jean is going to start us off. So you can relax for a minute. Give so me a minute. The second part is called supervising the creative doctorate. And if you're not supervisors already, if you're students, think of it from your perspective and what challenges you might give your supervisor if you were doing creative research. And if you're not doing creative research, just think about the potential of it and whether or not we should expand the much more formal way in which we currently do doctoral research. Gina, okay, yeah. All right, I'll just tell you, uh, I'll start by telling you a story of my very first PhD student and how risky this was. So she is a lecturer, in, uh, she's a nurse lecturer, and she, she lectures on health promotion. And she wanted to do research into taking health promotion through using students, nursing students, to conduct interactive drama <coughs> with school students to learn about, it was actually sexual health. Health promotion, nursing students, interactive drama, sexual health. Um, she was my first student, so I said, yeah, why not? Now I'd be a lot more cautious because what's creative, one thing that's creative there is you've got four different areas of elements of theories and approaches and already I'm worried about that. Okay, so we've got these four areas. So supervising her was tricky insofar as she knew a lot about health promotion so the literature review as it came out to begin with was that much health promotion this much interactive drama and not very much about teaching students. So we had to balance out the different bits of the literature review so she was comfortable, theoretically rigorous in all four areas she was bringing together to ask her research question. The next thing is, of course, she's doing this work with the students. She's working with them in the schools and she's collecting data from them and from the school students about how this activity enables them to take responsibility for their own decision making in terms of sexual health. So she's, work, she's taking a practical activity into a school and looking at what the school students say and what the students, her own students say. So now this is a complicated piece of work as well as a complicated research methodology. So the only way we could do this was action research. So she got her four theoretical areas and she's using action research methodology. Lots of people feel that that is too creative in itself because it goes through cycles. You try something out, you look at it, you share the knowledge with the people who are part of it, you change it and improve it, you look at it, you share the knowledge, you change it and improve it, you've got to stop somewhere. Four areas of work, action research cycles. I'm still with her, although I'm learning a little way behind her because she's such a good professional and she's trying it out and she's so competent. And the final product was a thesis that looked like a thesis. Yep. Describing an action research cycle. Everyone's happy with that. All the standard shapes. With a video, which is part of the research product, which has to be assessed alongside the thesis and the video is of her working with the students and, and um, of that whole process so that's her creative evidence so she's used an unusual methodology she's used an unusual thesis shape because it has a video as part of what's assessed and she's combined across different research areas but she's working in health promotion so to build on what Jill was saying it might be a piece of sculpture, but it might be in any 
kind of research area, that the creativity enables the student to ask a question and to produce a rigorous, very good piece of work. She, she came from Jamaica and when she got her PhD she was on the front page of the Gleaner. They were so pleased with her. Okay, so it's possible. But it was hard work for me and I think I took the risk because I was a bit innocent and naive. I didn't know what I was taking on. So we each had an interesting research journey. Okay, another light bulb with a fish in it. So um, I'm thinking of this as a bit of a paper or a piece of... Um, of uh, re research that we're delivering. We're going to look, at, look with you at our research work on this area and get you to think about the supervision process. Um, and we, we did some research with doctoral students who produced created doctorates. This student isn't actually part of it, but when we finalise the paper, I might now put her in because I've remembered her for you. And with supervisors who have supervised created doctorates, I just admitted to you I felt it was very risky and I, I had to learn alongside her. But I trusted her as a professional with the decision she was making. But I did have to persuade the examiners that the video was part of the thesis and not just an illustration that we put on in the background. So what did we do? What did we do to do this piece of research? We scrutinised data from earlier research projects, having a look to see if there were any creative pieces of research and supervisors doing creative supervision research in there. And these are two big pieces of research. One's called Doctoral Learning Journeys, which looks at doctorate students, supervisors and examiners. And that was in the UK. And there was a smaller parallel project that asked the same questions internationally. And then we went off. And so this is a, a, a research process. We've got some stuff. We have another look at it. And then we go off and ask new stuff related to that particular question that we've got that's partly emerged from re-scrutinising our old data. I think that's relatively creative anyway. We conducted some new face-to-face -face and email interviews with six doctoral students so far who identified themselves as creative. They're not all creative artists and the supervisors who are supervising their work. Um, we've got a lot of variety of information about what creative doctorates are, those in art practice to those exploring the creative processes in everyday professional practice. And, and I've just given you my health promotion student, but I have currently a student who is actually researching what he defines as mavericks in higher education. And that means people who do it their own way, who ask questions, who make people feel uneasy, but have been successful in this. They are risk-taking, they are consistently professional in their practice, okay, so they're still trusted, but they're likely to ask awkward questions and to do their work slightly differently. He calls them mavericks. He wanted to do this because he is one. All right, so he's embedded within the research case studies. He's in there as a case study different shape to his, his PhD then and certainly uh, a creative kind of area to be looking at. The maverick, the somebody who tests the bounds, who takes the risks. Um, so exa for example higher education manager mavericks and those who deliberately deploy conventional doctoral formats so to be safe in the shape of the doctorate because what you're doing is creative and those who push the boundaries of those formats, like my student who included a video, and they're creative in their presentation. So either ends of this, something artistic perhaps, something that's professional, something that is conventional in shape, but creative in its, its construction, and something which is unconventional in its shape. All of this and all combinations. You could get some of that. You might be doing some of that. What do you do? I was naive. I could cope with her. I'd ask some more questions. Now, 20 years later, I've got this student. And we're trying to make him fit in the box so that he'll get through. But he's bursting constantly out of this PhD box. So me and the other supervisor have a lot of fun with him. So we think about conceptual threshold crossing and we think m mainly about supervisors' experiences of the complexities of working with candidates like the ones we described and their sense of effective practices of nudging them 
Those who are engaged in research which deploys the creative to make learning leaps, face challenges, take risks, but don't undermine their chances of success. What struck me was that student at the beginning of my career and, and this one now is it's not fair if I make him take all the risks or make her take all the risks and I don't feel that their work is secure enough that the examiners are going to recognise it and give them the PhD. I can't say, go on and try it. Oops, it didn't work, did it? Never mind, next students. Can't do that. I've got to help them do the best job they can within an acceptable enough shape so they're going to get through. Yeah? But it's difficult because they're bursting out of the box. So we asked all sorts of questions about creativity and doctoral learning, about supervisory nudging, and the tensions between creative work and the university requirements. See, I don't think the university requirements ought to stifle creativity. They ought to be able to recognise this difference and let something through, which makes its case. As Jill was saying, talking about that other student, you have to be very strong to meet the challenges. So the student who is creative and gets through really knows in their defence why they did what they did, why they did it the way they did it, and what they've achieved. So they have all these fine elements of a good PhD postdoc ready there because they know why they do what they do and they know what it achieved. So we looked at, we are looking at students working in three areas, each of which are about access creativity, creative practitioners, artists, creative writers. We're going to give you a, a bit of each of this. A quotation then about creative processes. Creative processes draw from all areas of human consciousness. They're not strictly logical, nor are they wholly emotional. So sometimes people equate the creative with very emotional, a little bit strange. Um, it's not just that. There might be emotional elements in, in really strict um, experimentation, well I know there are, in science. The reason why creativity often proceeds by intuitive leaps is precisely that it draws from areas of mind and consciousness that are not wholly regulated by rational thought. In the creative state, we can access these different areas of our minds. That's why ideas often come to mind without our thinking about them. And that's a different Robinson. Okay, it's not Jill. Related. Not related. I want you to think about that for a minute. Those of you who were here yesterday, we talked a little about threshold concepts and conceptual threshold crossings. The moment when your student and you in your research suddenly get it, suddenly make connections, see things anew in a transformed way, which happens several times along the doctoral learning journey and needs to be nurtured by the supervisors and occasionally nudged. Those interesting moments are usually preceded by well, for me they are, and I've had lots of students say this, feeling that what you're doing is cleverer than you are. And you don't really know. You don't really know what it is yet. So a moment where you're thinking, there's more in this than I thought there was, but I'm not sure what it is. This data, it, there's, there's some patterns emerging, but I'm not sure what they are. There's some interesting theories coming together here, but I can't quite see it yet. Have you been in those situations? Yes? The moment before you see something new, we call it um, a liminal state, and that means it's between two states. Okay, it's liminal, it's in, the, it's in the middle. And that's a moment where you are accessing a different part of your mind. You're about to see something that you are creating. You're about to see something which is new. It's a bit too clever for you yet. And then you read, or then you look again at the data, you know, or you go for a walk, or you talk to people, and it starts to come into some kind of shape. As supervisors, that creative leap, that threshold crossing, is absolutely essential for us to help push and to recognise and say, you've got something here. Now let's have a look at how you can make it really clear so somebody else can read about it and so that you can make your clear argument. So the creative student who's got this new idea that's creeping up on them needs a bit of help to push it into shape so they can articulate it, so they can make their case in the thesis and when they get to the examination. 
And I think it's really important. It happens in every subject. Okay, so what are we doing then as supervisors? We're facilitating. Try this, try this. How about trying this? Now, what is it you just got? We're facilitating and eliciting. What is it that just happened? What do you understand more? How does that relate to that theory that you're working on? They've made a creative leap. They've now got to make it explicit. They can't just sit there thinking, I'm creative. They're going to have to share it. They chose to do a PhD. They're going to have to write about it and talk about it. Even if the shape's a bit different, they are going to have to find a way with our eliciting and our facilitating to actually get it out there. We nurture these good new ideas, this good new work, this creative work. And I've also called it choreography because I think as supervisors we match, we were talking yesterday about learner difference, we match the learning behaviours of our students as if we were helping them develop their own dance, their own way through, their own creative way through the questions they're asking, the work they're conducting and the way they write it up. And if we don't match that and enable them and push them on a bit and help, help come, come up with the patterns they can write within, they're just going to be left frustrated with the really good ideas, the creative ways of going about it and the solid block which is the absolutely conventional thesis. So don't let them fall because they've done something too unusual. Enable them to use the conventional enough thesis as a vehicle. And we're also like a gardener because we help plant ideas and we help recognise ideas and creative activity, nurture it and prune it. Uh, my current creative student, who is this higher education maverick, does so many things all over the place that me and the other supervisor are constantly pruning, cutting it back and helping him reshape it. Because otherwise it would, uh, it would go on forever and you'd never see what the themes and arguments are within it. So we're going, yes, that's nice, but what are you really doing here? That's fascinating. I like that. How are you going to use that bit? Can you see what I'm doing here? I'm cutting it back, helping him mould it. Because otherwise he would be so chaotic that he wouldn't finish. We haven't got there yet, so you need to ask me about it next year. But we have hope. So some tensions then emerge in our research, tensions between the forms of thinking, conceptualising, researching, the ontology of being in the world, the epistemology, construction of knowledge, of some creative research and the conventions of expression, the thesis. And we're trying to search for and we're finding examples of the appropriately enabling innovative hybrid forms of the research Ivor Goodson's narrative inquiry, Vernon Trafford using himself as a case study, this student using himself as a case study in a series of what are actually narrative inquiries to look at the professional higher educational maverick. And the supervisor then is an enabler, a nurturing colleague, and they're also a gatekeeper. Because if you don't keep the quality of the discipline and the quality of, that's recognised of the PhD level, you're not doing your student any good and you're not doing the discipline any good. And it's quite a different, difficult tension for us, enabling and gatekeeping. You know, no, you can't do that, that's not good enough. You can't just, you know, dance your way through it. You have to theorise it. Okay. Um, I want to ask you to talk to each other for a couple of minutes here. Have you supervised, have you supervised or undertaken what you would define as a creative PhD? I've given you a lot more space than a sculpture. Anything that was creative in your own work or creative in the work of a student, an undergraduate, a master's student or a PhD student that was creative. What issues and tensions and insights emerge for you in doing this? And the these are between the creativity and the standard shape. I've opened it up and said undergrad and masters as well as PhD. And what did you do to enable them, to empower them? So have you supervised it or have you undertaken something that's creative? What are the issues and tensions and insights in between the creativity and the PhD shape? But you can think of masters if you like. And what did you do or what could you do maybe to empower this? 
I'm just going to give you about four or five minutes to think about this. If you haven't done it, make it up. What could you do if you got a creative student? I had to make it up. Right? Five minutes. Please do what you can with that. If you haven't done it already, make it up. Go. Lots of noise. Ideas. Okay, the question was, what would you do as a supervisor? You've got a creative student in any kind of field and you've got the constraints of the PhD and getting them through the exam. What would you do? Or what did you do? Or what was done with you? Yep. Uh, of course, uh, I may still have not gone through this process, but whatever comes into my mind as uh, a creative person or imagine maybe I'm in such a situation, I really <coughs> believe that uh, a creative PhD is not just like a regular one. So it needs lots of patience from inside of the supervisor, maybe a change in her habits, maybe a change in her mindset. Uh, changing uh, her routine life in order to develop his information, knowledge, being curious even about the very common things which are around him in order to motivate herself. Getting along, getting along with and creative students, um, as you mentioned, needs lots of uh, uh, strength. The, the student is the supervisor can trust and have power or his power in order to be completely competent, having sound methodology or theory behind their work or his work. So the outcome would be something wonderful and uh, maybe in, uh, novel things or a new methodology in the field. Okay, so you, you need to be able to challenge and you need to be able to move yourself forward. Um, have lots of patience and change the way that you behave uh, not putting them at risk but you need to change if you're the supervisor and if you're the student you need to know that the supervisor has got to be willing to change so you might have to have that discussion at some point gently speaking ok yeah? <laughs> that's hard yeah. you switch it on or need uh, to give uh, you know, ask the challenging questions and then uh, then arouse the curiosity of a student uh, about the topic or the methodology of anything that is the issue and also give opportunity for uh, brainstorming and the mm -hmm. student comes with brainstorming and with new ideas so you've got some creative ideas you need to use some creative processes to bring them out and to make them visible so that you can now do something with them. Yes. And then uh, give the supervisor in this stage uh, gradually can give uh, specific feedback for completing, uh, for improving the idea. Yes. For As you would with any student. So a lot of this is going to be just straightforward good practice. And you're also thinking I need to change. I need to use creative stimulation perhaps to bring this stuff out. And this can be repeated for several uh, and for any so part yes. of the feedback, uh, for example. Yes, okay. Yeah, thank you. Can we be um, repeated through any part of the thesis process, like mm. the methodologies, etc.? Yeah. Okay, any other things you think that supervisors should do? Yeah. I think um, we want to be careful with that particular student terms of your approach. You don't treat him the same way you want to treat all your other PhD students because this one will be a special case. So I'm thinking um, for you to also encourage the students, you must be treated somehow special or that looking at the demands of his work so that the student can be encouraged to really work. Mm. Yes, encouraging them and demanding them. I think, I think all PhD students are special, but they're all differently special. 
and some are special because they're so rigid in their thinking you've got to kind of encourage the creativity and others are special because they're so creative you might need to help prune, prune it prune. and manage it into something that will grow any other thoughts about what to do yeah one more one more point yeah in this case, uh, there is some important thing that uh, at first students should be evaluated about the creative. If it's not so creative and the question is so challengeable, maybe uh, hmm. we make this appoint uh, the students and then we go with the students. All right. the, that, I think that's imp important. I don't know about evaluating creativity, but I, when you went on, I realized you didn't mean that. Hmm. that. Um, what we're doing is we're working out from what this student says and does, how far they can actually be creative and push the boundaries of the PhD. Because some people will be taking such risks, they'll fall flat on their face. So we're trying to get that balance, and everyone's a bit different. Anything else before we move on? Yeah, last one. Um, I just want to add something. You just talked about what should we, we do. But I think there are some those as well. Uh, there are so many cases that maybe a student is curious, creative, imaginative, but he or she goes astray. So it is, I think, the uh, role of the supervisor at the same time, just uh, taking the path for uh, the uh, creative PhD student to go forward, challenging and uh, help their or him. At the same time, should just that give them keep the balance, you put mm. her on the path of going forward, not just going astray, every time coming up with a new idea, jumping from here to there, it's it, it just mm. the matter of wasting mm. time. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, I'll pick you up on that. This, this is, our work's not gone this far yet, but this is my experience. It's not gone that, mm. in that distance. And Jill knows the student too. Um, we need these creative processes of brainstorming, etc., to capture and enable the creativity. But some students are so creative, they're, they're actually disorganized. They're creatively disorganized. I do have one of those at the moment. And the way in which we're managing him is, right now, we're asking him to do short, sharp, clear tasks. And short, very clear bits of writing. Because unless we get him to go into a shape, he goes all over the place. And, and my view of this student is that he says, what is this thing called a literature review? Ah, it is so new to me. Shall I approach it? And you say, it's just a literature review. Just get in a dialogue with the literature and write where your work goes. And then he goes, I could use all these methodologies. And it's as if he's walking through a completely unknown world. And the way in which we are enabling him to continue his creativity is to get, get him to work within the shapes that exist. And then he can push them a bit. So we've had to be a lot more structured and systematic and staged with him now, two years in, so that he can produce within an acceptable shape. And it's tough, and he's finding it difficult, but he's also finding that intellectually challenging. So sometimes it's about letting it go, and sometimes it's about drawing it in so that it is something that, c that can be manageable. It's a bit like bringing up a child, really, isn't it? <laughs> so you nurture and enable. Okay, yeah. Shall yeah. I? thank you. So we've got lots of patience, change in habits and mindset. You need to change, you need to be flexible, but that's about therefore enabling this very different person. You need to be curious, you need to ask challenging questions, treat students as special cases, but be realistic and keep a balance, and then maybe at some point they have to be curtailed so that they can do something creative and not just float about. Um, I'm, go I'm going to give you a quotation from this student, somewhere there. So I asked him, how do you see yourself at the moment? And he said, he's very good, he's very clever, he's going to get there. Something between a wandering minstrel. Do you know what a minstrel is? They, they walk around, they play, they play the guitar now. You can see them with a guitar on the back hitching on a road in Europe. Um, they play music and they wander around from place to place. They're creative, but they're um, not held down by anything. Something between a wandering minstrel, I suppose, 
and the person who paints the white lines down the middle of the road. Very structured, to a rule. Because sometimes it's very easy. It's slightly more analytical. You read something, it makes sense. You read something else, the two pieces fit together, so therefore you have a very clearly defined path. Now this is his thinking process as a creative person about being directed by two supervisors to produce a thesis that's going to pass, we hope. Other times, the wandering minstrel, you start singing one song and by the time you finish you're on a completely different theme and a different song altogether and you're wavering from either side of the road and it's not a clearly defined path because of the very neighbourless nature of narrative and how people perceive things. It's wholly un unscientific, which I love, but at the same time it has purpose and I can see where these different things are going. So he's aware that he's got a tension between wandering about and being creative and being absolutely structured. So how you supervise a student to enable the creativity to take shape is enable them to see they can be creative, a wandering minstrel, but they must recognise that they've got to put the white lines down the middle of the road as well. Or they won't get the thesis done. They'll just perpetually dance around. Right. Did you want to move on? Okay. Okay. We're going to pull together a couple of things about art, a couple of things about creative writing, and a couple of things about creative PhD more generally. Um, it's just a couple of case studies from our research. Um, Excuse me. Yes. Yeah. This, um, we are talking about creativity. Yes. I don't know, maybe that's part of it in the theory of the gets from the university, but getting him restricted. Now, why don't you open a research arena for such uh, individuals instead of cornering them again, and likely we won't get the best out of them? Uh, but for some, this is getting the best out of them because you can't corner creative individuals to get the best out of them. Yeah. You can manage them. And what we're talking about, I think, is when you, as a supervisor, have one of these very creative individuals, that instead of cornering them um, to get the best out of them, you manage them more, flexibil yeah. uh, more flexibly to get the best out of them. And you're also saying you, you would like them to help open up a different sort of research yeah, area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the centre of the road, we should allow them. Right, we yes, do allow right. them, but they've got to get through. So just yeah. let me give you one other example about someone who's got through. There's a guy called Jeff Hill, who's from Queensland University of Technology. And Jeff is a higher education manager sort of person. Now, about 10 years ago, you might have heard of him, but you look him up online. 10 years ago, he took the risk, as a very creative person, of producing his PhD thesis as a book, yeah, like we all have, and a cabaret. A cabaret. Somebody plays the piano and he sings the main elements of his thesis. Oh. Truly. Somebody plays the piano, Jeff sings, he's got a beautiful voice, the main elements of his thesis. Right? This is a road show now. He's now got one about supervising creative PhDs and it's another cabaret, someone plays the piano and he sings it. So sometimes he performs at conferences, he gets asked to do workshops. He's got his PhD. I bring him in, I brought him to both universities to help create that research arena because Jeff's very solid on you need to be creative, but it's going to be hard to be accepted. But I got through because I was both creative and I produced something that they recognised as a way of expressing his creativity, both the book and the cabaret. So part of that research creativity, when I had him there, we had 40 people came. They all wanted to know how you would do this balance. So that's part of that research, I don't know, momentum. It's bringing in people who have already done it to talk about how it happened so that other people might follow that model. So I don't think it is constraining, but we as supervisors have to help this particular student get out the end so he can turn around and we can bring him back and he can say what, how difficult it was, how exciting it was and how he did that balance. So I agree with you absolutely. It's not about squashing. Mm. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, one of the things we have to do and some of the examples in a minute will come from some students that we interviewed, is that you have to manage the disequilibrium and anxiety and risk. Because we talked about it being a risky thing. It's risky for the supervisor, but it's also risky for the student 
and in this state of disequilibrium sometimes, which Jean has just described, where her student felt at one and the same time the wandering minstrel and also the person constrained to paint the lines, we have to manage that disequilibrium as a supervisor. And this quote is from um, a book by Oscar Wilde, and he says, the artist discovers himself on the painted canvas. Well, for this, you can um, substitute the creative uh, researcher. Uh, the reason I cannot show this painting is that I'm afraid I've discovered the secret of my own soul. So it's actually, if you're a creative person, you're quite exposed because you're exposing your own creative um, thoughts. thoughts. Yes, which yeah. sometimes you don't want to do. Sometimes we keep our creative thoughts to ourselves because we're afraid people will laugh at us. So as a supervisor, you have to manage that state. Um, there was one supervisor who said of his student, uh, this is an art student actually, she, the student, doesn't want to engage with the kind of analysis that the PhD is asking to engage with. I mean, partly she feels exposed, but she also feels the magic would go. So again, as a creative person, you sometimes keep the thoughts to yourself because you feel there is a magic about them because there's something quite precious to you. Um, and so again, we have to make our students somewhat more robust um, Hockney um, and Alan Collinson say anxiety about the need to incorporate theory into the project sometimes disrupted the student's practice fundamentally so that the student lost confidence in the practice and became theory directed so sometimes uh, they switch the other way and the creative practice p uh, based part of the research um, orients towards the theory and then they lose the competence in their practice Supervisors would then attempt to reorientate the student's work, he said. And again, Hockney and Allison said, imbalances arose when the students were either reluctant to engage with the written analytic, which resulted in overcompensation in practice, or in contrast, when in their anxiety they focused on the theory to the detriment of the quality of the practice. In the case of the latter, supervisors became aware of the dangers of what some described as over-theorization, or pseudo-sophistication and had to face what they perceived to be a lack of real creativity and equilibrium. Consequently, supervisors strove to direct students back to a central position. So again, this is what you were talking about, um, balancing the student um, and where more balanced work could be achieved. So again, you are responsible for keeping the balance between the creativity and the over-theorization sometimes, which is a knee-jerk reaction to perhaps feeling guilty about the creativity and the practical side of things. Um, there is a dissertation which you will find online, which is by somebody called Nick Susanis, and it's totally in comic book form. So the whole thesis is in comic book form. Um, it is very rigorous and very clever. And his argument is that that way he is enabling a wider audience to understand his thesis because comic book form is very accessible to a wide range of people and so it's already on a there was a blog about it and it's already on a website um, it's called unflattening a visual <coughs> verbal inquiry into learning in many dimensions so it's actually got a very robust and rigorous um, theory base it's just that its presentation is in comic book form now, there are various comments about this, as you can imagine. One blogging person says, I applaud Mr. Susanis' transdisciplinary effort, and I'm really excited that more scholars are taking risks in these directions. It's encouraging to see that more doctoral students are approaching scholarship through artistic practices that challenge an easy separation between the form and content of scholarly argumentation. But... Another person says, this puts the practice-based visual arts and design doctorate student in an unusual, if not historically unique, position of having to consider both methodology and methodological rigour. Um, so some bloggers were really against this. And they, one blogger said, it's actually an opportunity for this student to do something which has traditionally uh, got a very recognisable format and he's not allowing himself that opportunity. So he felt the student was actually losing something which he was being offered by trying to do his thesis in another way. 
So there are differing opinions about the situation when a PhD is presented very differently. Um, sometimes the answer is through um, ensuring rigor and clarity and asking the student to explain clearly what they're doing, as we have said. Um, so a certain part of the PhD training must be concerned with the skills of clear and concise expression, even if it is perhaps through um, cartoon. But it's still got to be clear, concise, and rigorous. Gina, I think you want to go and say something about okay. your creative writing students. So we've heard a bit about some art students. I've got a creative writing PhD student and I've externally examined some creative writing PhD students and I've externally examined and I've looked at external examiners' reports about students for whom the create, piece of creative writing is at the heart of their work. So they're writing stories or they're writing poems and they produce PhDs around them. So this must be an unusual form. The normal form for this, because it's not that unusual actually, is that the piece of creative writing sits at the heart. Then you have, at the beginning you've got a critical introduction that explains how the creative writing was constructed and developed and what kind of questions it answers. Questions to do with identity or the future, um, my current student who's doing one of these PhDs has written a dystopian future story. So she's looked at things that are going wrong now, the ecological things, and she's put, put a story in the future and she's working out things that we might do in order not to get to that mess and what her character does in order to solve that mess. So that she's making a story that helps recognise a problem and also create, comes up with some solutions. So that's what fictions do, it's a piece of fiction. At the beginning she's explaining what she's doing, why she's doing it, like I just made a mess, because she does it better than me. And then she has this heavily well-researched theoretical background about what these kind of fictions do and how they operate and other people's work like that. It's a piece of critical theory about literature. One bit on her process, one about literature theory and the creative writing product and an end bit which sums it all up. So within what looks like a thesis, we're not quite there yet, looks like a thesis, we've got the, this different shape. Why I did what I did, so maybe that's a kind of log type journal with a critical edge. What is the background of this kind of writing and what it does? Here's my piece of writing, pull it all together why did I do it this way, what does it do, what does this piece of work do and where does it do, a bit of critical analysis and it looks like a thesis. Seems to me to answer all sorts of PhD problems, that one. So part of what I was doing in order to feel comfortable to work with her was to look back at what external examiners have said about such pieces of work. <coughs> Remember that external examiners for any PhD thesis are looking for rigour in the work, it's well organised, well expressed as Jill was just talking about, coherence in the way in which it's written, conceptual level of the work and also that it's presented well. In other words, no typos, well organised, well expressed. Rigour, coherence, conceptual level well presented and it, the whole should be publishable. Rigour, coherence, conceptual level, well presented. A whole load of research in, in um, Australia and also the work that we've done on external examiners in the UK and Margaret Kiley's work on external examiners consistently comes up with those sorts of four areas. Sometimes a different word is used but those are the four areas. So external examiners tend to make comments about that when they look at the creative thesis as well. And they're obviously going to say it's creative too. Okay, so I thought I'd give you a piece of an external examiner report because we went through hundreds of them. Here's one. I'm sorry it's so small. This is an unusual, exciting and boundary-breaking thesis and body of work. The body of work is it's a poetry volume, it's a book of poetry. The, f the form of a theorised, critically discussed creative body of work is in itself a challenge 
to the norms of the conventional PhD thesis. And so too is one which deliberately engages themes using, for example, in this case, the metaphor of the vampire. So she uses that as a metaphor, which breaks boundaries, as does this work by X and X. The first two chapters explore the thematic grounding, so now they're going through what, where this work fits in previous work, the Gothic cultural reflection of 1970s women's movement, the author's own identity as a lesbian, it introduces the guiding metaphor of the vampire as a boundary breaker, the liberating of expression which this metaphor enables, it also relates the inspiration from several other poets, I mean it doesn't matter what this content is, what they're doing is the examiner is recognising that this is theorised, that it comes from reading and embedding in bodies of work, grows out of a literature review, and situates itself as new within this body of work. But actually, it's a bunch of poems uh, with the author's own poetry and explains the trajectory of the work. The body of the thesis then presents her own writing in three sections, the hidden, the body, and the other. Chapter four explores the creative process so that the link is established between her engaged position as a lesbian writer, depression, expression, becoming the gothic historical influences which blend into the creative process and are seen to feed, seen to feed the poem. The development of the poetry from hidden to bodily involvement with a monstrous note, as if explained, blah, blah. Absolutely standard kind of external examiner report talks about the theory, talks about situating in previous practice in the literature, talks about how this new work contributes it and says, you know, it's good, I can see where it's going. She was conventional enough in doing an unconventional piece of work, which is this body of poetry, so that the examiner could recognise it still as a PhD thesis. Um, my student has written some bits and pieces of three different sorts of writing about the work that she's doing I explained the critical, the theorised one bit this section will deal with the literary context of my creative research I intend to use recent theorisation blah blah, next bit then she looks at recent work into which she's situating her own work in my 21st century examples the female characters blah blah, right so Here's the context, this is what my work's doing. And then she explains her novel, which lies at the centre of it. This creative writing student, who's in the middle of her work, is also an academic <coughs> in a local college, and she knows to theorise, situate, place, and then produce the creative. Okay. How do we encourage this kind of hybrid researching? She's done a lot of really interesting hybrid researching. In order to do her piece of work, she had to visit the places she wanted to write about. How did we, and she had to learn about creative writing or improve her creative writing. How do we encourage the hybrid writing? And how do we supervise this mixture of critical, contextualising, theorising, explanations and the product itself? And what if we don't like what they're doing? I haven't really thought about that bit yet. What if you hit a piece of creative work that you don't approve of or you don't actually like and you don't see the reason for? Can you still supervise it so that the best work is done? Because I've been quite worried when I've examined creative writing that I won't be able to be as objective <coughs> with it if I really don't like it as I would be on a thesis of anything else. So thinking as an examiner... You're going to have to get the right examiner who won't dislike the work and turn it down. We knew she had to leave a bit early, so bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you for being so active. I'm so Don't sorry, police so we No, we're nearly finished. We're nearly finished. Ten minutes. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Okay. Um, I just want to, I suppose I could end. Should we... Sort of end? Right. I want to end on somebody I met quite recently who is a, an, an Aboriginal person in Charles Darwin University who's got her PhD about three or four years ago. And she wanted to look at relationships to the land. If you know anything about Aboriginal people, they're very concerned about their relationship.
to the land. And she didn't want to just write a conventional thesis. So she's looking at land rights and land identity. So this is not creative in itself. But she sat with her mum and she sat with her friends and family and um, she wanted to do a conventional PhD so she'd get it, but she also wanted to use things to do with the creative in order to express her research process and in order to be part of her research products. So I, I only met her about eight weeks ago. And what she wanted to do then is to couple the community and the family as part of the supervision process and to produce a conventional enough PhD with research and theorising, but also with some artistic work. So she says she's going to do that, and she talks about rules and protocols, and at the end she says, right at the bottom, last four lines, so her mum says, why don't you do some artwork, because we've always done it in our family. So then I started painting on canvas for the first time in 2001 when I did them. So that depicts what we call here the wet season, and that's looking for the southwest when I was painting that day and I was standing at a particular place. She's in a land, she's writing about the land, and to, in order to do her expression about the land, she had to produce a painting. This is the size that it is there. So this is about her land, where she is, and the wet. That's part of her PhD. You have to have this painting and the next one, and the PhD, when you assess Linda. Linda Ford is her name. What are you going to do with that? Except I was amazed. And then she also talks about how difficult it was to position herself in the PhD. That was a part of the process for me to understand how I positioned myself within the PhD. And the PhD wasn't just going to be an artifact of Western academia. It was part of our Aboriginal life. Now that we haven't really gone into the whole cultural thing, how far are people being culturally shaped by producing a standard PhD? So when I was asked the question once, is it just another academic artefact, I said no, it's not, because my mum sung the thesis with the paintings that I did, and my daughters danced to it, while I painted bits in between, and now it's become a pathway for my family, particularly my daughters, to be able to integrate successfully. So they understand what the ceremony is, what it means to belong to the country, how to engage with people in the country and extended families through the ceremonies and what it means to come into a university environment. She's now, like Jeff Hill, talking to other people about how you might write from the community, bring in song, bring in art and produce something that's new. But it's also possible because we've got this thesis. I saw the thesis. It looks like a thesis to me. And so that's the dry. So we've got these two pictures and we've got the PhD. Her mum was part of the supervision process and her mum sang the thesis. <laughs> All right? Who supervised that then? <laughs> and who examined that and went, I can see what I've got here is something that is making serious statements about land rights and identity and does it in a way that uses them and the creative. All right, I think we'll stop with that one. Thank you. We haven't tried to turn you all into artists. Uh, we just suggest you're all creative people, whether you're students or supervisors, and we've just suggested that boundaries can be pushed, and we hope that that might have been challenging and interesting. Thank you very much for listening. Um, excuse me, I just have one question. Okay. Does it need to be does it need us to be experienced? Then we can supervise the community. Not if you remember Gina's first and my first vision was one of these students. Because they are quite, you know... They're, they're, they're difficult. I think yeah. the more we share, you know, we talked about a body of acceptable knowledge, the more we share these experiences, we can start to come up with ways of helping manage and enable students to be creative. So do we need to be experienced? Where do you start? My first student was almost the biggest challenge I've had, except the current one. Yeah. From our institute, there is a format for thesis writing. So how can I cross that format? Because we have three different thesis writing formats. But uh, you can show us some examples. Some student has done the thesis like a comic book or others, whatever it is. So how can we cross the boundary? 
I think you pushed the boundary. Jess Hill had a conventional thesis shape. My first student had a conventional thesis shape and a video. Jeff had a cabaret. Linda has a conventional thesis shape, two pictures and her mum singing. So, I, I, honestly, I'm, it's just my belief. I think you have to get in there, produce something they recognise, and then push them a bit. But it's whether you're comfortable with it. We're not saying all theses should be like this. For a lot of people, it's only the conventional thesis that suits their inquiry, their field of inquiry, um, and their character, their personality. So not everybody will be comfortable. It's just that we need to recognise as supervisors that there is the potential for something different. And if you push the boundaries too far, if you say, there's a wonderful collection of flowers there, this is my PhD thesis, I need say no more, um, you know, you're not going to get it. So I'd say conform enough and push the boundaries with the, com the thing that also conforms. Be rigorous. Constructive, theorised, makes a case, and then other people can follow. But as we say, you don't all have to do it like this. Okay. Right, we'll stop now and let you get on with all your supervising, creative or less so. And if anyone wants to come up and talk to us, yeah, we're, still, we're still here. We'll be here for okay. a while. Thank you. So we have now reached the end of this very informative two-day seminar. It is hoped that all the participants will be able to bring back as many valuable knowledge and information and be at our best in guiding and supervising our precious future generations later on. And I'm sure you have learned a lot. I do. <laughs> so with that, we would like to express our warmest gratitude to our amazing speakers for being here with us and share such valuable knowledge with us. We also like to thank all the participants for coming and participating interactively in this two-day seminar and we hope to see you again in future. With that, I end this session and may you, have, uh, may you all have a pleasant evening. Thank you. Thank you very much.